first off, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the R Studio Global Mastering Shiny X session brought to you by Absalom. My name is Samantha Toet, and I'm also known today as Info R Studio, and I'm excited to have all of you joining us uh, for a jam-packed session about using Shiny. Um, we've got a packed agenda today filled with experts joining us to share their tips and tricks for developing fantastic Shiny dashboards. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some logistics. So, um, perfect, thank you, Damian. So first off, the recording slide and any demo code from today's workshop will be shared following RStudio Global. It'll be shared over email and it'll be on the RStudio website, um, rstudio.com slash resources. Uh, during the event, uh, if you have any questions, please post them in the questions section in the GoToWebinar panel. They'll be answered either during the presentation over chat or during the Q&A session at the end. If you happen to have any sound or connectivity issues, hopefully there's none, but if so, you can log out and then connect to go to, um, reconnect to go to webinar. And if you don't mind bouncing over. And um, I'd also like to just thank all of you for joining us at one of the very first events kicking off our Studio Global this week. As I'm sure all of you know, our Studio Global is a virtual 24 hour event with speakers from all over the world. And the 24 hour marathon officially starts on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So now let's go ahead and get started. So without further ado, Damian, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Samantha, and welcome everyone to Absalon's Masterclass. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, start this session uh, with Samantha. Uh, let me first introduce uh, the panelists today. Um, you already met uh, Samantha Toet, uh, the partner manager who created the session uh, for us. Uh, we have also from our studio, Tom Mock and Shannon Haggerty. And on our side from Absalon, we have Marek Rogala, Olga Mierz-Vasulima, Pedro Silva, uh, Filip Stahura, myself, uh, Damian Rajevic, and Dominik Krzeminski. With us, there is also Jordan Gray, who is behind the scenes and uh, has done a lot of uh, great work with Samantha to make sure that we can present to you uh, this uh, masterclass. Uh, so thank you, Jordan and Samantha. Um, I'm very excited uh, for, the, uh, for the time we are going to spend together. Um, the whole uh, event is going to last uh, two hours. And the agenda is as follows. Uh, at first, uh, Tom uh, is going to present uh, theming Shiny and our markdown. Uh, then Pedro is going to present styling Shiny with uh, CSS and SAS. And after five minutes break, we are going to learn about speeding up Shiny applications. Then Dominic is going to have a guide uh, to Shiny open source. And Olga will share with you the best practices for developing Shiny applications. Then after five minutes break, I'm going to share with you how to scale Shiny to thousands of users. And at the end, we will have uh, Philip and Marek, our CEO and CTO, uh, share with you the future of Shiny. And they will talk about Shiny Fluent, Shiny React, and more. So be sure to stick around. At the end, we will have the Q&A session. Uh, we should be able to answer all of your questions. Make sure to write them uh, in the GoToWebinar panel, and we will be very happy to uh, answer them. First, um, let me briefly introduce our company and so that you know who we are and uh, what we normally do. Um, we have been established eight years ago, and uh, we are focused mostly on data science, R and Shiny, and machine learning. Uh, we are a global, fully remote company consisting, consisting of over 30 uh, team members, and uh, we have very different special specializations uh, from the software engineering uh, through R and Shiny, uh, machine learning, but also graphic design uh, and infrastructure. And we work with Fortune 500 companies to provide them the most value they can get uh, with R and R Studio. We also contribute uh, to open source. We always try to get what is the most uh, valuable for our clients and uh, put together the packages that help us tremendously on, a, on our daily basis. Uh, so you can uh, check out uh, Shiny Semantic, Shiny Info, Semantic Dashboard, Shiny Worker, uh, Shiny Internationalization, or Shiny Router. Uh, these packages are used by a lot of companies. They help us tremendously, and hopefully they will help you as well. Be sure to check them out. Um, our purpose is to improve and preserve human life through exploration and technology. That's why we also contribute to the AI for Good movement, uh, which means that we um, invest ourselves as well to help our planet get better. Um, we provide reduced rates for the companies uh, that want to do good on our planet. And you can uh, read more about uh, us in Euronews Independent or uh, check out the uh, YouTube link here. And the sites are going to be shared with you so you can click around uh, later on. And also we are hiring. So if you're looking for challenges, if, if you would like to uh, try out something new and uh, get to know a lot of uh, different industries and provide value directly there, 
or maybe you know someone uh, who would like to do so, uh, let us know. We have a lot of open positions. So you can go to epsilon.com slash careers or uh, contact us at join at epsilon.com. We would be very happy to uh, talk to you. Stick around for the Shiny Innovation module uh, to receive an invitation for the early access program. Uh, Philip and Marek are going to share more uh, about it. So I'm uh, uh, now uh, going to give the, the voice back uh, to Tom and Shannon. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, our session. Excellent. Tom, I'm going to go ahead and make you a presenter. Sounds good. And you can show your screen. There we go. All right, we should be able to see my slides. I can see them on the broadcast. Are we good to go there? Yep, looks Perfect. great. All right, thank you so much, Sam. Um, Shannon and I are gonna be talking a little bit about the thematic and bootstrap lib package today. Uh, in short, these are new packages to theme Shiny, as well as our markdown and traditional web content. And we're really excited about kind of the breadth of what this can do for theming and uh, kind of the ease of use to get started. So first off, uh, introducing these packages, Bootstrap Lib, or what we're calling BS Lib, is really just simplified theming of web content via Bootstrap. Now, web content meaning could be Shiny, could be our Markdown, and you know Bootstrap as well as for traditional web pages. So there's a lot of power there. Uh, thematic, on the other hand, is a kind of a complementary package to BS Lib, which is simplified theming of R plots, meaning ggplot, lattice, base, and plotly. Um, that is kind of works in conjunction with BSLib. Both of these have package down websites where you can find out a lot more info about them. Thematic is on CRAN already, um, and Bootstrap Lib is kind of waiting in the CRAN queue, so it should hopefully be the next few days. Um, if you want to get started with them today, you can always install the dev versions from GitHub, as you see here with this code. And a big thanks to Carson Sievert, who let me adapt some of his slides for today's presentation. Um, he's one of the core devs working on uh, both Bootstrap Lib and Thematic as part of our Shiny team. So first off, for some folks, you may have been using Shiny before. Um, you may have been using our Markdown before, but less people are kind of aware of using Bootstrap natively. Um, and what this is, is really just a lot of CSS and JavaScript plugins for front-end web development. Um, you can dive deeper into Bootstrap, and we're going to have a great presentation about SAS, which is kind of using these variables right after this presentation. But in short, this is kind of working behind the scenes in BSLib and other packages and kind of provides you all these niceties without you having to know about it. So Bootstrap Lib is a wrapper around custom Bootstrap themes and makes it really easy to theme your documents and use things like SAS variables without having to write all this custom CSS out of the box. Now, if you do know those skills, and if you gain those skills from someone like Absalon or have them working with you, they can further extend your applications with CSS or SAS variables. But again, this is really kind of a R interface and functions where you don't have to know all of it to get started. And again, you've been using components of this through Shining R Markdown for years. You just probably didn't know it. So to start using BSLib, it's really just a one function call. So we have a very basic Shiny app here for the UI component, and then we're also gonna load the BSLib package. So we could call a fluid page, although it could really be any component of Shiny. And this theme argument will take BS underscore theme as the argument. So this will provide kind of an interface to BSLib and all the different theming components you could do, like background, foreground, fonts, changing all these different components in bulk on the page without having to write individual CSS for each item. So fluid page, navbar page, bootstrap page, all these different things have the same kind of theme equals BS theme argument. And again, you may have been using this uh, theme argument, something like shiny themes or writing your own custom bootstrap CSS. Bootstrap theme is more powerful kind of in our minds because you are providing, you know, again, SAS variables and all the niceties of Bootstrap in there. Again, either the power or the ease of use kind of both balanced together. Now, something to note here is that uh, for, for Bootstrap users, this is moving from Bootstrap 3 to Bootstrap 4, which is a more modern, more recent implementation of Bootstrap. So there is some compatibility layers here that should help most Shiny apps just work out of the box and upgrade to Bootstrap 4. 
However, if you have some legacy applications, you could always try version equals three here in the BS theme argument uh, if it is kind of messing with, the, with your overall theming. Uh, but for new applications, just stick to Bootstrap 4. It, it's, again, a more recent version, and, and that'll be the good recommendation. Now, in terms of what Bootstrap 3 versus Bootstrap 4 looks like, really, it's hard to tell the difference. You might see it here in terms of, like, this blue is a slightly lighter. The fonts are a little bit different, maybe not as bold. Really, most of the benefits are behind the scenes. Like just switching from version of three to four might give you this more slightly modern looking feel, um, but it's not going to change, you know, the core of your application just with the the base theme. But there are again lots of things built in there that it's worth upgrading to four. To preview a theme and actually get into some of the bulk of what uh, these themes can do for you, uh, you can call this new function from BSLib BS underscore theme underscore preview. And this will take BS theme as an argument, and you can provide either custom themes that you've built yourself or full boot swatch themes, which are essentially open source free themes that other people have created. So you can see with essentially one line of code, we've taken this basic shiny application and themed every component of it. So the fonts are different. This is perpetuated into all of the dropdowns. So the date, the select input, state ranges, the slider bars, all those will respect the right colors, the right fonts, uh, and other components that you're changing. As well as the kind of uh, pop-ups or action buttons. So primary, secondary, warnings, danger buttons, accent colors. Again, all of this is changing um, kind of in bulk and together in a unified interface. So if you want to just use one of these Bootswatch themes out of the box, they're going to be very powerful and should be very pretty. A lot of them have been kind of used for front-end development for years. But you can also kind of customize uh, wide portions of your app uh, with things like SAS variables or other functions built into Bootstrap. So again, while I've kind of hit on this a couple of times, I really want to protect people in terms of don't be scared if there's things in here that you haven't seen before. Um, if you want to learn those, you'll be even more powerful, but they're not necessary to use it. So if you did want to dive deeper into SAS, again, there's going to be a presentation right after this about it. And there is uh, some documentation about the SAS R wrapper uh, for, you know, R packages that will let you kind of learn how to use those. In, in short, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but SAS is really a meta language on top of CSS. So if you think of CSS as changing individual components, SAS would kind of provide a more elegant or systematic syntax, letting you change multiple things at one time. And this usually leads to more manageable style sheets or, or styling in general. So I mentioned earlier that you can create your own theme. So we showed a pre-built Bootswatch theme. Now we're using essentially the same argument, so Bootstrap theme, but we're uh, kind of mandating what specific components we want to change. So again, this theme may not be the most pretty thing to you. I kind of made it a little bit garish just to pop out. Um, but you can see the background is gray, the foreground is black. So we have a you know, background of gray and then the font will be in black. The primary color is this uh, lovely purple, which goes along with Our Ladies. And I really do like it. Maybe not with this gray theme. Um, and then we changed the base font to Francis, which is kind of, again, a very different font. And you can see that the font is perpetuated into each of the different sections. So yeah, I don't really love Francis as a, as a theme or as a font, but you can see that each of the different parts are changing, which is the, the part to highlight here. You might also notice that I didn't have to load externally a different font. I just said, you know, pull in this Google font, Francis, and I could change it to anything I want, uh, and it will automatically pull in the style CSS and the Google font, download it, and load it in your application. So making it really easy to import Google fonts, and there's hundreds of different ones you could use here, as well as the most common ones used in web dev. If we switch over to probably a better palette in terms of not one I created randomly, but uh, one that's based off something like Material Dark, you can again see that we've changed all the components at once. So the background's changed, the foreground is still this lovely purple, um, and then we have a new font, this time Fear of Sands, which is one font that I actually really do like. And again, it's perpetuating this into the sliders, into all the different components all at once. And with minimal code, I'm able to create a robustly themed application. 
we'll go over a demo of like what all these different things are. In short, like this screenshot shows you the bulk of it, but you can use uh, Bootstrap Preview with this to like show what plots would look like, what tables would look like, notifications, different fonts, and you can actually customize it live inside the Shiny application, which is really cool. And so I will show you that right now in terms of what the preview looks like. Let me pull this over here. So if I, again, I'm inside our studio, um, I'm just gonna pull up this code chunk I have here. So bootstrap theme preview, and then I'm providing it with some arguments to the bootstrap theme component. So if I run this, it'll load uh, the Shiny application. I'll make that full screen. Give it a second to spin up. And now here is my kind of matrix themed uh, Shiny application. So again, it, all the different buttons work and I can change things like the font. So maybe I don't want Firmano and I want Lato. I can close that out and it will change the fonts. I can go to accent colors and say, well, I don't want the primary color to be green. Let's do F0, F0, F0. We'll make it like a white background or primary color. And now everything's here in white. I can go over to plots and do uh, let it load for a second. My CPU is getting some pressure from the uh, from the web screen or webcasting. So the the plots here are perpetuated and have those themed as well. The tables are themed to match the background, notifications, all these different things. So again, as you're kind of playing around with different themes and want to change them, you have this ability to see what all the different components of an application look like without having to write all this different code just to test it. You could obviously like, you know, run up your actual production application locally and see how it looks with the theming, but this allows you to change things really quickly. All right, so we'll close down that and go back into the slides. You can also use BSLib uh, with our markdown. Now, this is somewhat experimental today in terms of it is, you know, it's been focused on Shiny. I think that's really what we want to talk about today is Shiny. But you can imagine that there are also our markdown documents that have a Shiny runtime or just our markdown documents you're generating. And you want to theme those as well. So a uh, one of the versions of our markdown that should be merged soon allows for theme arguments. So you can change, again, the background, the foreground, the primary, the base font. Uh, very similar to what you're doing with your BS theme argument in Shiny proper. If you don't want to write out the whole theming component yourself, you can again get access to all the boot swatch themes. So something like solar, you can pull that in automatically by name. And while I'm really excited about kind of the future of our markdown, this is still more experimental in our markdown and you'd have to install this uh, GitHub version of our markdown to test it out. So maybe wait a little bit for our markdown theming, but Shiny theming is really gonna be ready in the next few days, which is very, very exciting. Um, again, for using some of the Bootswatch themes for, for Shiny proper, um, in the past, this was through the Shiny themes package. So you would load like Solar or Darkly or Minty, all these different Bootswatch themes, which are listed here in terms of there's a full list of I think two or three dozen different themes you could use. Um, this is just going to be loaded with boot swatch and then, and then naming it within whatever fluid component you have. Um, there are some newer themes from boot swatch 4 that weren't available previously. Um, and so we are switching to, you know, bootstrap 4. So if you wanted to use an older theme, you could look at older themes, but there's some newer ones as well that are really, really cool. Awesome. Okay. So uh, we've kind of gone over a bunch of different things that are themable. I'm going to turn it over to Shannon here in a second to walk through Thematic, which is the complementary package to BSLib. But things that are currently themable in the next CRAN release, which again should be in the next few days, the Shiny package proper, uh, our Markdown HTML document, as long as you have that specific GitHub version, uh, DT data tables, which are perpetuated through Shiny, and then really any bootstrap compatible HTML and CSS. So you can add to this and add other style sheets um, that are bootstrap compatible. Some of the other things that are soon to be themable and that the dev team is working on and would love your help in terms of open source contributions or asks or different things that are working on is some of the other HTML based R Markdown output formats. So beyond just HTML document. 
Additionally, a lot of the HTML widgets have to be perpetuated through. So Plotly will work through ggplotly, but in terms of Plotly proper, Reactable, which is a package similar to DT for reactive tables, and then some of the other extension packages like Shiny widgets uh, that provide additional widgets that are not in Shiny proper. One of the things that's fundamentally unthemable via CSS and therefore Bootstrap or uh, SAS or uh, BSLib is plot output or essentially R-based graphics. So Lattice, ggplot, base R, those are images. They're, they're not CSS in the classical sense where you can change the components. They're generated by R. Um, so the, the way to get around that is to use thematic, which actually translates the CSS components into these R plots. So in this case, um, we'll use thematic to further extend the theme from BSLib into things like plotting components. I'm about to be turning it over to Shannon, and she's going to be walking through uh, the thematic portions. Yeah, thanks, over to Tom. You, Shannon. So once you've gotten your um, Shiny application or R Markdown beautifully styled with uh, BSLib, one thing that you'll notice is that the plots are not automatically styling the way that uh, Tom just mentioned. And so that's where you're going to want to use thematic because uh, once you've gotten that really nice look to your Shiny application, you're going to want to pass that on to your R plots as well. Um, so that's where thematic comes to the rescue. And what you can do inside of um, Shiny is use this function thematic underscore Shiny. And you see that we have that uh, BS theme set inside the Shiny application. And now that um, setting is being passed on to the plots inside of our Shiny application. So thematic is giving those R plots the ability to um, translate, as Tom mentioned, the a custom styling of the Shiny application into our styling and, and give that plot a very cohesive look with the rest of the Shiny application. So what the thematic uh, package in general does is that it changes the default of the R plots and you can use that thematic underscore Shiny function to turn the customization to the plots on inside Shiny, but you can also use a function called thematic underscore on to turn it on globally. And if you um, do that, you can also within that function set the specific background, um, foreground and accent colors that you want for the plots. So you can you know, set the, the theming of the plot there. Um, and the other thing that you can do is that you can actually set the font. And we have set the font here to Indie Flower. And Indie Flower is actually a Google font. Um, what Thematic does that's really cool is that it will automatically download, cache, and register with R any Google font that you want to use inside your R plots. Um, the other thing that Thematic can do is in the slide before this, we customized the theme of each of the plots, but we can also um, Thematic will also just grab the auto theming, so it will detect what the HTML container uh, settings are of the plot, and it'll apply those to your um, R plot. And what that looks like uh, inside of an R Studio session, so if you've turned thematic underscore on, if you've run that function and you're in R Studio and you have a, a custom appearance, your R Studio theme set, it's going to auto detect that R Studio theme. So you get this actually really nice look inside your RStudio session where the plot is actually um, looking again cohesive with your RStudio session. Um, and then similarly, it'll do that same thing where it'll automatically detect your um, our markdown settings or your shiny settings. And so if you have used BS underscore theme and customized your shiny application, the auto detection, the auto theming inside thematic is going to be able to apply the settings, the aesthetics that you've set for your Shiny application to your plots. So why this matters? Um, it's because it's going to help you to create really cohesive, um, beautiful R Markdown and Shiny applications. After you've spent all that time customizing the look of your applications of your R Markdown report, Thematic is going to let you easily apply those settings to your plots to, again, make everything look really nice and cohesive. Um, you can still use traditional uh, theme settings inside ggplot for one-off plots, but what Thematic will let you do is, is apply that to the whole document, the whole application, or to um, all of the plots that you're making in our studio if you want to. 
And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tom, who's going to show you some thematic in action. Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah, so uh, as Shannon mentioned, you know, you can use it with our markdown, you can use it inside Shiny, and then it will also work directly within kind of just an interactive session. So here I'm going to load the thematic and ggplot libraries. Um, I will turn thematic on, just as uh, Shannon showed in the slide deck, like we're setting basically a theme for everything in the session. And then I can just create a ggplot. So this is a very simple empty cars ggplot that everyone's looking for. Um, and it will, you know, perpetuate what I asked it to here into the plotting panel. In terms, of we have that red theme, we have the white uh, and black background. For me specifically, I'm using the Dracula or Studio theme. So if I didn't want to perpetuate something forward, I could actually just tell it to use whatever is in my environment. So in this case, what's going on in our studio in the IDE theme? So I can create the plot, call the plot, and again, it will um, kind of use the pink and the dark purple and the black and the gray that is made up of the RStudio IDE theme I'm using. Um, for BS Lib and Shiny, you know, the Bootstrap theme preview we did will also show you a plot that automatically themes the plotting portion because it's calling thematic as well. For our markdown, you know, you, we showed that you could do thematic and BS Lib for those uh, items proper. So here I have a theme component inside in our markdown doc. So it's an HTML document. And then I'm calling uh, auto uh, for thematic here because it's gonna reflect whatever the BS lib components are. So if I knit this, it will actually go through. This is again, just the basic uh, RMD. It's got a, a base R plot, a GG plot, and then a summary function. We'll let that build in the background and I'll show you real quick what that goes to. And then we'll wrap things up. All right, move this over here. So again, this is uh, perpetuating all the components into the R Markdown. So the font is obviously vastly different. It's using kind of this nice purple as the primary color. Uh, the base R plot has been reflected to, you know, also be cohesive with the overall theme and ggplot as well. So again, this idea of like you can theme shiny, you can theme plots, you can theme R Markdown all by using similar syntax. Um, let me pull up the slides, I'll just rebuild. The beauty of our markdown slides is I think I closed it down, so I'll just, I'll just rebuild it real quick and we'll, we'll close it all up. Get to slide 32. All right, get all the way to the end here. All right, so yeah, th thank you for hanging out with us for the past you know, about 25, 30 minutes. Um, in, in summary, you can use Bootstrap Lib to theme Shiny and our Markdown. This will upgrade to Bootstrap 4 by default. If you're having apps breaking, you can always downgrade to version equals three. Uh, you can use Bootswatch or custom design for your own custom themes. You can use Bootstrap underscore theme preview or Bootstrap underscore themer to quickly preview and update themes interactively. There's a full-blown article about theming with BS Lib, uh, a link here that we'll share in a second. And you can use thematic for easier theming of R plots in conjunction with Bootstrap Lib. So R Markdown, Base R, ggplot, uh, Lattice, all these different components can be tr you know, perpetuated with the theming through. I'd really like to thank Karsten Sievert for letting us adapt part of his slides. And thank you to Absalon for bringing us in today. They're gonna have a lot of wonderful presentations about SAS and more theming and their uh, semantic package, which is a way of like getting further away from what traditional Shiny apps look like into really, really custom, really, really cool applications. And I will stop talking and thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Tom and Shannon. That was really cool. I am definitely gonna go play around with some of those new functionalities after this. So next up, we've got Pedro, who's gonna be talking about styling Shiny with SAS and CSS. Pedro, let me go ahead and put you in the driver's seat and you should be able to share your screen. Excellent, looks great. Right. You, should, you should be able to see it now. Okay, so uh, thank you, Tom. And I'm really also really interested in BS Sleep. I've actually started playing around with it 
a tiny bit before uh, in the previous project. I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, for my presentation today, I was I would actually like to uh, talk to you more about how do you actually do custom solutions. So uh, it's it's very common in Shining that you end up having to uh, create custom components, create custom widgets that uh, you end up having to style them again, uh, but because they aren't, uh, there's no package for them, there's, they're not part of Base Shiny, uh, you end up having to do your own custom styling. Uh, so with that, uh, we can get started and uh, I will just a uh, quick introduction about me. I've been a Shiny developer with Absalon for closing in on three years now. Uh, before that, I was a web developer for uh, the better part of eight years. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of the skills that I actually got as a web developer kind of translate very well into Shiny. Uh, and also I'm an open source uh, creator and contributor uh, with Absalon as well. And uh, you can reach me in any of those social medias. So if, you, if you'd like to check out my codes, uh, take a look at GitHub. Uh, if you just have a question or would like to get in touch, uh, you can also reach me. Uh, so for today, I will uh, give you a small introduction of what CSS is, in case you don't know. Uh, I will also talk about the different ways that you can actually add it to Shiny. Uh, I will talk a bit about SAS and uh, SAS, uh, a package from RStudio. Uh, I'll give you a short introduction just to get you started and also how you can use it to Shiny. Uh, so, like a very quick uh, introduction, the crash course to CSS, what is it? Uh, so CSS is basically uh, how the internet uh, describes, uh, describes the way that elements are displayed on a page. Uh, basically, it lets you control uh, multiple elements by the usage of classes and selectors. Um, and basically, it's made of very small instructions, which are called statements. Uh, statements do simply two things. So they identify an, an object in the page and they declare a value for a specific property of that element. So this is a very simple example of what a CSS uh, statement would look like. So you can see that we're styling something that has a class of search box and we're styling the border in the, back, the background of that specific element. Uh, the cool thing with CSS is that if you have two elements or 10 elements or 50 elements with this specific class, uh, they will all be affected by, by this specific rule. Uh, so why is this really important for Shiny? Uh, the thing is, uh, every web page right now, in some way or another, uses CSS, and Shiny is no exception. So even though you're programming in R and you're building this Shiny application, uh, behind the scenes, what's actually happening is that Shiny is generating some JavaScript, some HTML, some CSS, and the key part here is the CSS. So because uh, some CSS is being generated, we can also add our own on top of it. Um, so how would we actually go about doing this? So uh, with Shiny itself, there's three uh, very specific ways that you can do it. Uh, so you can add the style directly to your tags when you're building your UI. Uh, you can add it as, a, let's say, a separate tag in the header of your page or your application. Uh, but you can also store it in files and link those files directly to, to the Shiny application. Uh, so for the first one, uh, whatever you create in your UI, uh, as long as it's an HTML tag, uh, you can always pass a, a special style attribute, which lets you basically pass any kind of uh, CSS statement that will affect that specific element. So here there's no... Uh, statements, there's no classes, there's nothing. This is style that you want to apply to that specific uh, to that specific element. And uh, this is fine, this is okay, but uh, to be honest, this is probably, this should be your last resort when it comes to adding uh, CSS to Shiny. The, the truth is that uh, by adding, uh, it, it's fine if you have one or two elements, but when you get to 10, 20, 50 elements, when you start having very complex UIs, uh, you lose track of where you style the specific thing. Uh, you cannot reuse uh, any any rules. So if you have three titles, you need to style the three titles. Uh, it's very hard to keep consistency between all the all the, um, the elements. This is 
uh, something that if you use bslib for example it's solved for you because it's uh, there's general rules that affect every element but if you're doing these individual changes you won't be able to actually keep track of them as as your project grows um the second way would be to add css to your header so this is slightly f better this is uh, uh you can add a style tag uh with some some text inside and that text can be css text uh, this is slightly better. Uh, this does mean that you can use those selectors. You can you can uh, apply the same styling to a lot of elements at the same time. But at the same time, uh, you won't really be able to uh, leverage the browser here because because you're generating the CSS whenever the page is created. This actually means that uh, your browser won't be able to cache these. Uh, so, and by caching, I mean uh, saving them for future usage when you reopen the, the application later. Uh, so you end up having a slightly better approach, but at the same time, it's still not the ideal approach. Uh, so we can always do the third option. So this would be to create a, start, uh, to create a file with all of our CSS on the side, uh, link this file to our Shiny application, and then the browser actually has something that it, it can save for the future. Uh, and at the same time, we have a specific place where we have all our styling neatly saved, packed away from our code, from our logic. Uh, this is this is much better. This is probably the the best uh, the best approach you can take if you're using just regular CSS. Uh, you can reuse the code. You can reuse the the rules. Uh, you can cache these files. Uh, your browser can leverage the cache to actually save these files for later. Uh, it also allows you to uh, kind of separate your styling into multiple files and start adding a bit of structure to, to how you're saving uh, styling for different elements, for different modules. Uh, however, CSS is still something that can get very complex and it's kind of this thing that grows out of control very fast as your project grows. So there's still a bit of room for improvement here. Uh, so one way that you can improve this workflow even better is to use SAS. So uh, SAS is, uh, as Tom mentioned before, this is a, a, a language built on top of CSS. And the idea here is that it's a uh, preprocessor to CSS. So it's uh, any any SAS that you create always ends up being CSS. But there's this layer of abstraction where you have a few different tools, then you don't really need to worry about creating very complex or managing very complex CSS because SAS gives you a couple of ways of managing it a bit better. So uh, a couple of differences here between SAS and CSS are uh, SAS is object oriented. So this means that uh, you can have nesting. It's more about the concept of what is a specific element that you're trying to target, not the specific element that you're targeting. Uh, it also allows variables. I know that CSS3 is actually uh, pushing forward with variables in CSS. This is, uh, I think, a very nice bonus, but it's one of the things that uh, SAS, at least at my understanding, still does much better than just CSS. Uh, and also, you can always use SAS to actually generate CSS variables to, to reuse in the future. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of uh, really interesting things that you can do with SAS. So uh, we talked about nesting. So what nesting means is that you can simplify a lot of the rules that you do by uh, nesting them. So as you can see, CSS doesn't uh, CSS on the right side doesn't really allow for this. So if you're targeting two different elements, in this case, for example, a UL and an LI element inside of a navbar, you're going to need to create the full selector every time you, you create a rule. Uh, SAS kind of solves this by allowing nesting. So if you have two elements inside the same, uh, the same uh, element, you can kind of nest them together and simplify your code even a tiny bit more. Uh, we also talked about variables. So uh, CSS does allow variables, but SAS does it in a way that you can kind of uh, uh, declare them even in separate files, completely different. There's uh, no scope required, which is something that CSS variables need. Um, and you can simply use them by assigning uh, a name to a property that starts with a dollar sign and then just 
uh, this becomes a variable that you can use throughout your code. Um, it also has the I, it also has two very important mechanisms, which are extends and mixins. So extends is kind of uh, and this is something that is very well explained with uh, an example. So uh, it basically allows you to share uh, styles between selectors. And uh, the way that you would do this normally in, in CSS, if you would have two elements that you would like to style, even though they are very similar, is that you would simply do the styling for both of them. Uh, by using extend, you can actually create a partial part of code uh, by using the, the percentage as, as, um, as a marker for the name of that block of code. And you can then extend uh, for each element you can simply extend the name the the extend rule that you created uh, and the code will actually be copied into that selector so this means that you can reuse uh, parts of styling that you use very often by simply uh, extracting them into a separate name that you can then reuse uh, the second one is mixins. So mixins are slightly similar, but these you uh, these work more like functions. So the the idea here is that uh, instead of simply taking out a piece of a block of code and saving it with a name, uh, with a mixin you're actually having a function. So this means that you can pass specific arguments to those uh, functions that you're creating. So in this case, for example. Uh, we've identified that the only difference between these two components is actually the border size. So we can create a mixin that has an argument of border size and simply call those functions in each of our declarations for each specific element. Um, so small introduction of SAS, a very big, a very crush coursey uh, kind of thing, but hopefully it shows you uh, some of, of the advantages that you actually have. So uh, how do you actually use this with, with R? So the, the, the best way is, of course, to use a library. And R Studio was kind enough to actually create a really nice package for, for us. Uh, so you can, you can um, use RSAS to uh, not have to worry about all the pre-processing. Pre you just need to write code. This is all you want to do. And in general, uh, the package gives you one big function called SAS, and this SAS function can take take either a string or a full file and just returns the CSS to you. So all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, techniques that we've been talking about, you now have access to them inside of R uh, directly without, without having to, to uh, without actually having to, to, to work outside of, uh, of uh, R files. Uh, the second way is actually, you can actually pass it uh, reference to a file. So here, for example, we're simply pointing the SAS function to our styles main file. And this file has a lot of internal stuff for SAS. And this way you can kind of file all of your, uh, you can kind of split all of your styling into something that behaves a bit more like code managing and uh, actually lets you reuse a lot of the styles and kind of keep a grasp of uh, styles when it comes to very big projects. Uh, a second argument that's very important in this function is the output. So the output will generate that CSS to a specific file. And then this is something that you can simply add to your UI. And now you have your all of your styles saved in a project, uh, uh, in a, 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 a project a folder structure that has everything well sorted and you can kind of manage them. Uh, if you would like to see an example of SAS being used uh, uh, very extensively, I will point you to my uh, Shiny Contest entry from last year. Uh, I've used SAS quite a lot, and hopefully it will guide you in the right way to, to, to get started. Uh, yeah, and I think my 15 minutes are up, and uh, I will just like to thank you for this. And I also, I know that the slides will be available later, so I've also added a couple of ref uh, resources here to, to get you started with SAS. And <clears throat> uh, in case you really want to get into CSS, there's also a couple of bonus slides with some of the selectors that uh, I, I think are the, the at least the basic ones that you you need to know for C, uh, for CSS. So hopefully this will get you started, and in one year you'll be thinking, uh, how have I been using 
CSS without SAS. Okay, uh, and I think that's it for now. So I will stop sharing. I think we have a small break now. Perfect, thank you, Pedro. That was really cool. Um, yep, we're gonna go into a small break right now. So Jordan is going to take over the driver's seat just to share some screens. Um, so we're gonna take a quick, let's do just like a five-ish, little over five-ish minutes. So it's 9.47 right now. Let's come back at 10.55. Um, that's probably a different time for every single person on the call right now, but let's come back in, what is that, eight minutes? And in the meantime, we will be showing, Jordan will be showing some slides. Yep, my time to shine. Pedro will be back for the next session.
All righty. And it looks like we are, it's 9.55 a.m. for me. So why don't we go ahead and get back with part two. It looks like our next presenter is going to be Pedro again for uh, showing us how to speed up Shiny apps. So let me go ahead. Pedro, I will hand it back to you. You are already a pro um, and you are already a presenter. There we go. Awesome. So you, sh uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yeah, we can see it and we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, so a bit of a change of pace now. We talked about styling. Um, let's talk about speeding up uh, Shiny apps. So small disclaimer, this is going to be just some of the, the uh, I think, very important details that you always need to take care of. Uh, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to speed up everything using just uh, these tips, um, but hopefully it will get you started uh, when it comes to at least identify some of the, the issues that your Shiny app might have. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three very important details when it comes to speeding up Shiny applications. Uh, the first one is update functions. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about proxy objects and proxy functions. Um, and then I will finish up by uh, letting you know a bit about custom messages and browser offloading. I won't get into too much detail. And of course, every package is different and needs, is, needs different types of optimizations, but hopefully this will uh, help you get started. So update functions, what, what are update functions? Uh, so update functions are, very simple functions that let let you update existing uh, Shiny widgets. So the important thing here is that uh, Base Shiny has these, uh, but it's very possible that you're not always using them. So uh, as an example, we have a very we have here a very simple Shiny application that has just a checkbox and a dropdown, and you can see that in our UI we define a checkbox and we define a UI output. And then uh, in our server, we simply ob observe that a checkbox and we change our select input uh, label and values uh, depending on, on the, um, uh, the state of the checkbox. This feels very standard. This is, uh, simple. This is something that you probably did uh, quite a lot of times already. Uh, however, you can see that we're not really using any update function. So what do I mean by that? Uh, What's happening here is that every time we trigger a change with the checkbox, we're actually re-rendering the dropdown. So you can see that uh, because we're using a UI output and then filling in that UI output with our dropdown, uh, what's actually happening behind the scenes is that whenever this uh, output changes, uh, Shiny is removing all the, the bindings that it created in the background it creates a new set of bindings for a new dropdown that just hands, uh, uh, it, it does have the same ID, but it's a completely new dropdown and has to rebuild the whole structure. Uh, so this, we can probably do better here. And this is where update functions come in. So if we simply uh, change uh, our codes to instead of using a UI output uh, to simply render a select input, and then instead of uh, filling in the, the UI output, we simply use the update select input function. Uh, this is completely different. So in this case, what's happening is that there's a call from Shiny being sent to the, to the browser that says, hey, update this specific input that already exists in the browser uh, with a new label and some new values. So you can see here that these are very small changes, but uh, it's already slightly different approach to how we're actually building the application. Uh, but does this really matter? And just to give you an example of how, uh, what kind of uh, improvements we're talking about, the difference, even for this simple ch uh, ch uh, dropdown, is actually that for the page to be completely re-rendered and ready for the user to use, there's a, a it, it goes down from 15 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. 
So just a simple, and we're not even talking about the very complex uh, thing that we're doing here. It's just a simple drop down. Uh, it's already a massive improvement. So you can you can imagine that if we're talking about 50 drop downs, 50 elements that we're re-rendering, uh, these really add up add up uh, very quickly. Uh, so why is this actually better? Uh, like I said, the update function is actually just sending a message to the browser and then updating that specific element. So there's no need to rebuild anything. It just uses the bindings that Shiny already created for that specific element. Uh, but when it comes to update functions, these are present in uh, most Shiny widgets out of the box. So if you're using even just base Shiny, any kind of input that you create, uh, it probably has a corresponding uh, update function. So action buttons uh, always have an update action button, select inputs always have an update, select input. And you can see here that there's a bit of a standard where the update function is always uh, the name of the UI definition of the, the widget with a pref prefix update. Uh, of course, always make sure to check the documentation. Usually these are linked in the bottom. Uh, after the, the 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 function definition, you have some information about what kind of updates actually exist and what kind of arguments can actually be updated with that function. Um, so these update functions are nice, but what happens when we have slightly more complex widgets? And this is the case of when you have, for example, a DT table or an eCharts chart or a leaflet map. Uh, these usually work slightly different because we're talking about very complex, uh, very complex widgets that a simple update function is probably not enough for, for everything. So this is where proxies come in. So proxies are basically a way to reference an existing widget, an existing complex widget. And then usually they have their own set of functions that behave similar to uh, uh, update functions, but are applied to that specific instance, instant proxy instance of the the widget itself. So uh, a lot of what usually happens is that uh, an example is DT. So um, you render, you create your data table output, you fill it in with render data table. It creates a table. Uh, by using uh, the way to access the proxy to that element that we just created is actually to use data table proxy. So this is a function that also exists in DT and lets you uh, save a reference to a specific table with a specific ID that was defined somewhere else. In this case, it uses the same ID as the data table output. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is uh, basically an example of how you could use proxy. So we define our data table output. We fill it in with our render table and some, in this case, uh, the iris data set. And then if we save the uh, reference to the proxy of that element using data table proxy, we can just manipulate it. So in this case, we have a small checkbox. And every time the checkbox changes, we call a specific proxy update function, which in this case is select rows. And we just select or not don't select the first five rows of the table. Uh, exactly. Um, so one important thing to know here is that uh, different packages also have different update functions. So it's important to know uh, to figure out these functions whenever you need to use them. Again, documentation is always your friend. So uh, if you if you uh, check for this data table proxy function. You'll have a lot of information about all the update functions that come with that proxy object. Uh, and internally, the proxy actually works very similar to, to the update functions that I mentioned before. The, the difference here is that instead of having one update function, we actually have a, a family of update functions and an object to apply it to. Um, Again, it's important to check the documentation. You won't always be able to update every single thing. Uh, so there's, it's very important to know the family of, 
proxy update functions that exist. Uh, hopefully, there will be one that does what you need it to do. If not, uh, we'll probably uh, we'll actually talk about it uh, now, which is uh, custom messages. So if something doesn't really exist, uh, you can always create it. And this is part of the beauty of Shiny uh, generating that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that we were talking about before. Because the fact that deep down uh, you're still working with a web page means that you can use uh, JavaScript by itself to actually augment Shiny even more. Uh, so what are custom, custom messages? Uh, so when I mentioned the update functions, the update functions are basically a one-way call to the browser where internally there's some uh, code being run, something that you don't really know, but you know that it's going to trigger something in the browser and update it. What's actually happening down there is similar to how custom messages work. So you can trigger JavaScript functions from R directly, uh, or you can let, or you can trigger updates in Shiny from the browser. Uh, there's uh, three three functions that kind of give you the whole uh, behavior of custom messages. So in R, this is the send custom message function. In JavaScript, this is the add custom message handler and the on input uh, change uh, functions. So uh, I will give you another example of, of uh, Shiny Decisions, my, uh, my Shiny Contest entry from last year. So one of the things that I had to do was uh, I had a leaflet map that was, <coughs> sorry, uh, I had a leaflet map that was displaying some, some markers, it was being updated. That's fine, there's always, that there's an update function for leaflet that lets me change the data that way. Uh, but I wanted to have this extra behavior of actually changing the saturation of the map depending on how bad you're ac you're actually uh, doing in the game. So I, I this isn't something that is standard to leaflet. This this had to be custom built, and this is where custom messages kind of came in. So uh, from the JavaScript side, remember there's uh, the add custom messenger, me mess uh, add custom message handler function. And basically what this does is it lets you uh, run a function whenever a specific ID is triggered in Shiny. So the, what I mean by that is that uh, it kind of registers the handler so that it can be triggered from Shiny. So in this case, I have this update map style handler that will call this update map style function. And the update map function will just, it will create some CSS that kind of gives you that, that, uh, 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 that sepia filter that gets a bit more uh, evident whenever the, the, your scores are very low in the game, or it goes up whenever and goes back to the normal colors whenever you're doing better. So now we have, some JavaScript behavior, and we have a Shiny handler to trigger that behavior. So on the R side, we just need to send the custom message for the same ID with whatever values we want to pass to the, uh, to the JavaScript uh, function. So two simple functions, and we already have a leaflet behavior that doesn't really exist before. Uh, as, a, as a very small proof of concept, the way this is actually working is that from R, the, the way the all flow works is that from R you're sending a custom message. That custom message is looking for a specific handler. That handler is triggering a specific JavaScript function. That's it. There's there's no mess and there's no magic here. So now we can from Shiny trigger things in JavaScript. Uh, but what happens if we we want to do uh, the opposite thing. So we, we actually want to, and uh, I just realized these are actually traded. So uh, the first one is actually JavaScript, the second one is actually uh, Shiny. So if we have a JavaScript function that's doing some work in the browser, uh, how do we actually tell Shiny that something is happening, uh, that something happened? 
so we can use this set input value. So this set input value works very similar. It has an ID and a message. And what it does is that it sends a message to Shiny that can be observable in the list of inputs in the Shiny session. So this means that our input JS value will actually be, be changed into the message that we pass from JavaScript. So we can just observe it, uh, do whatever we need. So now we can pass messages from the browser uh, back to Shiny. And uh, another example of something that uh, uses this kind of behavior in the same application. So here I was observing whenever the user made a choice, and then I was just sending using this uh, set input value so that I could observe it in Shiny and actually know that something changed. Uh, so why, why are these important when it comes to speeding up Shiny? So uh, because these allow you to actually pass a lot of the, uh, to run whatever you want directly in the browser, this means that you can free your Shiny process to actually do uh, only the important things. So if you have very small, uh, uh, very small changes that are just UI changes, and don't really need to go to the server. This is one way that you can trigger them. Uh, it also means that if you have uh, some kind of code that already exists in JavaScript, you can actually just trigger that code instead of having to rebuild it in Shiny. So this, this speeds up not only Shiny itself, but actually the Shiny development because you won't need to just redo uh, the same function again in a different language. Uh, it also allows you to extend these update functions that we talked about before, simply because there's uh, there's no there's no need to write a corresponding uh, shiny function, a corresponding update function, if this is something very specific to your to your application. So it's uh, very easy to get started and very powerful. Uh, of course, keep in mind that you will need to know a bit of JavaScript at least to get started. Uh, but if you don't know it by now, I definitely recommend you to at least know some of the basics because it's very, very powerful when it comes to Shiny. And that's it from my part. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, just reach out uh, or check the slides after. Or um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there's always some some more. Uh, questions in everyone's mind. You can also just leave some questions for the Q&A later. Uh, I'll probably answer them if, uh, as long as they're not too complicated. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pedro. That was really fascinating. There are a ton of questions coming in, so um, I will. I'll record them and the ones that we don't get to come to today during uh, during our Q&A session. Maybe we can do a follow-up blog post or like a community post, but we will get some of these questions answered. Um, also, Definitely. for folks that are interested, this is being recorded and all of the materials will be made available following our Studio Global. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Dominic to give us Hi. an overview of some shiny open source projects. All right, my slides are moving, I guess. Yep, looks great and we can hear you. Perfect. So welcome everyone. And in my talk, I will discuss some aspects of, of Shiny open source. But before we move on, let me briefly remind you why our community praises Shiny so much. So first of all, you can prototype your applications like very fast. So you can create your first POC in a matter of like hours rather than days. That all comes uh, wrapped in a neat user interface powered by Bootstrap, so you don't really need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to, to styling. Obviously, you can customize it, as it was shown in the previous presentations. Shiny leverages the power of R when, when it comes to the data analysis, so in the backend, you can use those powerful packages from the Tidyverse family, for instance, and Shiny also uh, it's nicely integrated with a large number of visualization packages like ggplot, leaflet, data table, and even more. Interactivity, so how different UI components talk to each other is quite easy to understand. But with all those advantages in mind, sometimes I have the impression that we forget that the true power of Shiny lies in the fact that this is fully open source software. And I came to realize that recently when I was like reading again through the a blog post describing the, the winning solutions to the second 
uh, annual Shiny contest, and I realized for how many different applications you can actually use Shiny. So here we have uh, an interactive data storytelling. We have a machine learning backed application for visualizing your musical taste. We have data analysis dashboard that presents uh, the most popular GitHub repositories. And finally, you can even make games as proven by our very own Pedro. But all of that wouldn't be really possible without all of those like shiny extensions that are available now. And every year there's even more and more of them. So there is no way that I could cover all of them in details due, during my 10 minute slot, but I decided to cherry pick just a few without which I can't even start uh, thinking about, about starting developing my own uh, Shiny applications. So let's kick off with uh, Shiny JS. Which is, uh, which is a package from Dean Atali that lets you perform common useful JavaScript operations in, in Shiny, like hiding elements, disabling inputs, resetting values, or aler alerting some variables that I often use for debugging myself. The cool thing, though, is that you don't really need to know any JavaScript to start using that, because everything is wrapped in uh, R functions that are nicely documented, so it's quite easy to get started. Then we have Shiny widgets, which is basically a collection of, of extra components to enhance your Shiny applications. The repository contains a big selection of the components that are usually nicely documented with little code snippets, such that you can copy and paste the code and, and adjust it for your own needs. Some of my favorite elements are, for example, picker input, uh, those fancy checkbox button, or horizontal multiple choice selector. Then we have a small but rather powerful package, uh, Shiny CSS Loaders, that helps you with adding a loading animations to the output instead of graying them out. So I mentioned you already that Shiny uses this power of R for data, data analysis, but, but certain actions can take a while, so it's better to provide our user with some feedback that there's something uh, happening in the background, so you can do it with simple one function call with spinner that, uh, pro that adds to your uh, shiny those like little animations. Okay, and I wouldn't be myself if I haven't mentioned about some packages that help you style your apps, as in Epsilon, we care a lot about how the apps look, so starting from the left, we have BS4 Dash that provides you with Bootstrap 4 uh, admin LTE skin for your dashboards. Then we have Shiny Mobile, mobile that, that, help, that helps you create mobile-ready Shiny apps that look almost like native apps for iOS and Android. And then on the right, we have our own Shiny Semantic that helps you to attach an alternative look to your uh, Shiny applications. Okay, and I mentioned that I just scratched the surface here. So there is even more fantastic uh, Shiny extensions that you can find on this uh, Shiny Awesome repository that I discovered recently. And, and uh, this, uh, this uh, little repository summarizes and categorizes uh, various uh, Shiny extensions such that you can always find something that you, that you need there. I encourage you to check it out. Okay, but using all those Shiny extensions is just like one way how you can take advantage of Shiny open sourceness. Uh, but you can help yourself with, with building uh, those tools. So first of all, you can start from something as simple as reporting a bug or, or bringing some like new idea to the table by creating a new, new issue on, on GitHub repository or emailing an author of the code. But remember to be respectful with that as very often open source code is created by enthusiasts or as in our case, this is something that we do outside of our daily work with clients. Then, if you feel comfortable enough actually to, to fix some bug or, or uh, contribute with, with new idea to, to certain package, feel free to do some coding and create a new pull request. But remember first about reading a contributing guidelines as they usually contain a useful information with what to do or not to do on a given repository. Remember about testing all of your changes 
so that you see that you didn't break all the like previous functionalities of the code and always ask politely for a review and it's good to have another pair of eyes to see to, to check the quality of your code okay but uh, now if you still see that there is some um, uh, that there is no solution to your problem available then you can move on and uh, think about creating your own package and remember that for starters it doesn't really need to be perfect uh, some solution is better than no solution whatsoever and and always you may find someone in the community who would be interested in collaborating and moving the project forward if you don't really have time to do all the coding on your own and then a couple of tips from from me uh, remember about adding tests to your package from the early beginning as it will really spare you so much troubles at the later stage of the development remember about the documenting your code for you it might be quite obvious how to use your own functions but not necessarily for the users of your package and recently it became a good practice to add interactive examples to 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 your repository such that users can test uh, what this like package actually can help them with before they even uh, download it and then comes the fun part so remember about publishing it sharing with others to get credits and acknowledgements it's it's really satisfying feeling Okay, with that, let me mention our very own Epsilon open source family related to, to Shiny. So you have a variety of packages here related to, to styling, packages that help you with debugging, translations, and, and routing. Uh, I will not go into too much details here as we, as we have a separate uh, pre-recorded video available where I uh, discuss some of the uh, possibilities of those packages in a little bit more details. Just let me mention here that every year we try to extend this list. So stay tuned as later on Philip and Marek will tell you a little bit more about our two new projects. Okay, so to, to sort of like prove you that, that uh, our packages can be useful, a uh, couple of months ago we decided to challenge ourselves and, and try to implement a fully functional Shiny applications in less than 24 hours. So here you have a screenshot from two out of like six entries to this little competition for the comprehensive list of all the amazing solutions, you can check uh, our blog post. And if you can wait and you still want to see uh, all of our packages in action, I encourage you to visit uh, Shiny Tools website that we set up uh, recently. And it contains references to the GitHub, to, to the documentation and, and live examples of all our packages so you can test them if they uh, can be useful for your uh, Shiny development. Okay, so that's uh, all I get. Thank you very much for your attention. Feel free to ping me if you have uh, any questions and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the session. Cheers. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to go dive into some of those shiny semantic packages. Um, so next up, we've got Olga, who's going to talk about some best practices with developing shiny apps. And Olga, I'm gonna go ahead and make you a presenter. So you should be all set. And we cannot hear you yet. Can you, con can you confirm that you see my screen right now? I just done music of myself. We, yep, now we can hear you and we can see your screen. It looks great. Um, okay, so th thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, I always find it uh, energizing uh, to hear about the awesome work that the uh, community is doing. Um, so now let's dive into the best practices for developing uh, shiny apps. Um, so actually you can build apps that last and in my talk I'm going to cover uh, three um, areas, which is organizing uh, Shiny app code, organizing your development environment, and organizing your testing. Uh, since we have limited amount of time, um, this will be a high level overview talk. And I'm going to introduce concepts and tools uh, you should be using and tell you why. Um, so if you're not familiar with them, you can explore them 
uh, in more details uh, after the talk. Um, so, uh, how should you organize uh, the code inside your Shiny app? Um, first answer is uh, use Shiny modules. So, Shiny modules let you decompose your application. Uh, so, you can follow uh, don't repeat uh, yourself uh, coding uh, principle. They offer encapsulation, modularity, reusability, and um, uh, allow you to uh, test the whole components. They allow you to organize your app in a server and a UI part, uh, which in essence um, means that you can define your own pair of server and UI logic um, and use it inside uh, your app or embed it in the other module. Um, so, uh, secondly, you can also um, organize your code using R6 classes. And an R6 class is a modern and fast um, and simple implementation of orient or object-oriented programming uh, in R. You can uh, look at it as a more organized uh, shiny module. And R6 classes introduces a clear system of getting uh, the current the current state of the piece of the functionality, the operations that can be performed with it, the auxiliary functions, and the initial state of the object that can depend on the particular user rights, which might be uh, actually super useful. So how do you organize your code uh, using R6 classes? So you can uh, keep each class in a separate script with a name uh, similar to the class name. You can um, store the scripts in a folder uh, separated uh, from the other code. Uh, you can import the code um, using a package or as in a, here in an example, using a use function uh, from the modules package. Or, uh, and uh, then uh, you can initialize the class uh, with a, a new method, which is automatically, automatically available uh, for all the classes and attach it to some object. And um, the, uh, the first uh, option is to use um, uh, modules from uh, the Honey. And uh, um, I would like to avoid some confusion with uh, Shiny modules. So um, the modules I'm going to talk right now is something completely different from uh, Shiny modules. Um, so the modules are the organizational unit uh, for the source code and they can contain uh, shiny modules or R6 classes or just uh, functions you define. And the cool thing about them is that they enforce rigor when uh, defining the, the dependencies. It means that uh, you have to explicitly declare which uh, functions or packages uh, your code is using and you have to import them. And you also have a full control uh, of the things that are um, available outside the module because you have to export them uh, using the export function as shown uh, here in the uh, example. And additionally, they have a local search path and they can be used as a subunit within the package or in scripts. Uh, so to put it all together, Shiny modules are six classes and modules. So Shiny modules, they let you reuse UI and the server parts as a component. R6 classes, they let you build objects that have a single responsibility and implement given logic. And the Honey modules, they encapsulate dependencies and let you organize uh, files that could be Shiny modules and R6 classes as a separate units. So, okay, uh, we covered uh, how you organize the code. So not, now let's talk about uh, the development uh, environment and um, how you can uh, organize it. So, um, continuous integration. To ensure uh, quality, um, automate checks. You can run, lint, and test automatically for every push change. And especially for tests, you probably will forget to run them every time. So, just automate it so you don't, think, you don't have to think about it. And additionally, you can uh, automatically add a pull request template that can contain a checklist for a pull request creator and the reviewer to every pull request. You can uh, push 
you can block pushing directly to master and block uh, pull requests, um, merging pull requests if the test uh, fails. So um, here are some popular uh, continuous integration options, uh, Bitbucket, Circle CI, Travis Jenkins, and uh, GitHub Actions. So I'm sure you will find something that will, that will fit your uh, technology stack. And remember, uh, you don't have to start from scratch every time, and you can start. You, you can use a project uh, template for it. So at Epsilon, we have an uh, internal uh, project pattern with a shiny boiler boiler uh, plate uh, template, and we use it to initialize the repository structure if we start a new project. And it contains a simple shiny app with uh, modules and uh, shiny modules set up. It also contains a sample uh, unit test and the CI with lint and automatic unit uh, test uh, set up. Okay, so uh, how actually your um, development environment should look like. Uh, so uh, let's start um, from uh, from the other way. So what happens if you don't uh, take care of it? Uh, so um, development environment is a crucial part of working in R and uh, it's not only shiny specific. So um, otherwise, uh, if you don't um, take care of it, uh, you can end up with the same uh, code giving different results on different machines. Other projects can be affected, as in a global environment, shared package can change and crash unrelated projects. You can imagine the deployment is long and difficult, as establishing uh, infrastructure is challenging if it's not being tracked. And last but not least, team will waste time setting up a new environment rather than jumping uh, straight to work. So this might not be a problem when you're starting a project, but imagine that you have to urgently add a new team member in the middle uh, of one. So to solve all those problems, um, we recommend um, a following setup. So you can do uh, a development uh, in, in RStudio running inside a Docker container, which is fixed and dedicated per project. And you can leverage Docker and RENT package to control underlying system, system dependencies and R packages. And uh, Docker and RENT together make uh, team collaboration easy. So all the changes to Docker file and RENT log file that reports the packages used in the project are committed um, to the Docker Hub repository and to the code repository, um, for example, GitHub uh, that your team is using. On the other hand, the previous solution still requires um, some level of DevOps skills. And what we observe uh, with our clients, uh, especially the enterprise one, um, they uh, choose to work with our Studio Server Pro that allows their data science team to purely focus on delivering value using their core competencies in a highly secure and flexible environment. Obviously, here you still want to use RENT to control the R dependencies and uh, keep them separate uh, for every project so different team members can easily uh, collaborate. So uh, the last bit um, I'm going to talk is uh, testing and um, my message, sorry. And um, my message here is just uh, do it. The only question is what test and in what proportion you should be writing. And um, we will use a testing pyramid to answer that. So you should aim to have the most unique tests and data validation. The next um, test up components, aka test your shiny modules, test the whole scenarios with end-to-end -end testing, uh, perform load tests, and finally test usability with user interest views. And uh, now let's quickly talk about the tools you have available. Um, So for unit tests, I'm sure uh, you all know the test that package, so just use it. But please set up your architecture early and don't tell yourself an excuse that you will do it later because that will probably uh, won't happen because your uh, Shiny application would be awesome and your clients or your business partners would like to move on to something else. 
So start each project with test architecture. I, you already know that you can have a project template uh, to set up uh, at the beginning. You also know that uh, you can use a continuous integration to trigger uh, the test automatically uh, so you don't have to do it uh, manually. And please write at least some tests for each piece of code and it would be easier to extend them later. Um, and obviously keep your standard, standards high, so do not accept pull requests that uh, don't include uh, tests or actually break them. Uh, so um, now uh, it's part uh, for a data validation, and this is the um, this is the logic, this is the um, functionality that you should be uh, doing on the same level as uh, the unit tests. So as we uh, all know from our experience, data can be very messy. And actually, Kaggle users reported that this is their uh, biggest pain, the dirty data. So I want to introduce you to a data validator package, which is a tool for creating reports uh, based on uh, our OpenSci assert our uh, uh, results. Uh, and it allows you to create user-friendly reports that can be generated automatically, for example, with uh, RStudio Connect. So how can you use Data Validator Package uh, in production? Here's the uh, example uh, workflow. So you can run RStudio uh, Connect scheduler daily, and the scheduler can uh, source the data from a database and validate um, the results. Based on the validation results, a new data validator report is created. And we have uh, two scenarios here. So the validation fails. Uh, in uh, that case, uh, a report can be sent to a responsible stakeholders. So uh, um, a responsible person can actually take action and fix things. And obviously, on the other hand, we also have positive scenarios, so everything is great. So uh, the Shiny app can be refreshed with the new data. Um, and the, the next step that I'm uh, going to cover is end-to-end -end testing. So the um, phase when you are actually uh, testing the full uh, components in your app. And luckily, we have the Shiny test package from our studio, and that it's easy to use for developers. You can record the scenarios, and it provides a quick and simple way to test your Shiny apps. On the other hand, for more complex apps, we recommend using uh, Cypress. Uh, but uh, please uh, be aware that it requires uh, knowledge of JavaScript, um, but it's really, uh, really powerful. And um, we reached the point that your application actually is ready uh, to go live. So you want to make sure that it's able to uh, handle the traffic. So here uh, you can use Shiny load test uh, package that enables you uh, to load test uh, your deployed apps. You can estimate how many users uh, your app can support. You can identify bottlenecks and you can use the test output to guide you through the changes if the, if the optimization is actually necessary. Okay, and the, the last bit that you really have to think about. So you also uh, want to make sure that what you're actually uh, building is useful for your users. So, uh, um, um, so please uh, talk to them and you don't need to have a big uh, budget to do that um, because you can always use the hallway tests. And the idea here is that um, you can show uh, the application to your colleagues or to end users and let them click through it and they can describe what they are doing and what they understand is happening. And research showed that if you do it uh, to five people, you will learn uh, around 85% of the usability problems. And obviously, if you uh, don't do it at all, you will learn zero problems. So the things I want you to take home, organize your code with shiny modules, R6 classes or modules, depending on app complexity. Use CI to run lint and tests. Use rent to control R dependencies 
and uh, automate uh, code testing and data validations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, I really love that section on testing. I need to get better at testing my apps as well. Um, so with yeah, that, I think this is going to jump for everyone. Yes, it is. I'm going to jump into our uh, our second break. So we are at exactly 10:40 a.m. Eastern time here. So I'm going to hand it over to Jordan. He'll go through some slides again, and then at 10:45 or five minutes from now for everyone. We will reconvene here for Damian, Merrick, and Philip to close us out for the day. Um, so Jordan, I'm gonna give it the presenter mode over to you. And we'll see everyone in a little bit.
Alrighty, folks. So we are at uh, 10.45 a.m. here on the East Coast. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, let's see, Damian, let me hand over the presenter. Mo oh, looks like you are already there. Excellent. So Damian, I can see your screen. If you want to say something, I can confirm your audio and then you'll be all set. Perfect. Can you hear me? Awesome. Sounds good. I'll let you go. and. Thank you, Samantha, and uh, thank you for the previous presentations. I uh, hope everyone is uh, excited about uh, the content. Um, and uh, today, uh, in, in this presentation, I would like to share with you how to scale uh, Shiny to thousands of users. Um, my name is uh, Damian Rzewicz, and uh, I'm of the founders of Absilon. Uh, I'm also a technical person, so I work hands-on uh, on a lot of projects that we have. Uh, that's why I have uh, first-hand experience in scaling Shiny applications. Be sure to leave your questions. I'd be happy to discuss them, and you can contact me later if you have uh, any further questions to discuss. So let me start with a very simple success story that I keep seeing over and over again, and I'm really excited about this. Uh, thanks to Shiny, you and your team are able to build a successful app very quickly. Sometimes it is just a matter of days. Uh, you start having your first uh, uh, clients, customers, users. Uh, very often these are internal uh, users in your own company. You're helping them understand uh, better their process and go through the process much faster. And suddenly you have uh, more users that are using your application. Um, very often we see that uh, people who start using your Shiny application love it from the first day uh, because the fact is that thanks to Shiny, you are able to implement new features very fast. Uh, Shiny is super flexible. Uh, you just uh, make the changes on the go. Uh, everyone loves the application and uh, it does exactly what uh, people want to do because uh, this is a dedicated software that you build for them. Suddenly you realize that you have a huge amount of users that are using your application and there starts uh, to, uh, it starts to become a problem uh, because some would report to you that your application is actually slow or some will tell you that uh, they are blocked and they cannot uh, click around your application. And this is usually when uh, um, you decide to seek for the solution. And uh, these are usually the questions that uh, we are asked. Uh, how to make my app faster? How to scale my Shiny application? How to build a scalable uh, Shiny enterprise application? And um, one thing that I would like you to first think about is the fact that most of those questions usually start with a question, how? Um, we are very used to trying to find the solution as fast as possible. Um, we want to find good tips and tricks. We want to understand what's going on and just apply uh, new techniques. Um, but there are two other questions that are uh, even more important that you should be asking. Uh, the first one is why, and the second one is what? Um, let me share with you a quick story. There was a client that had uh, their car broken down and uh, they went to the mechanic. A mechanic looked at the car and they realized that the engine is broken. They took the hammer and just smashed the engine. Uh, then suddenly the engine started working again. And the client asked, okay, that's awesome. How much do I pay for this simple service? And the mechanic says, you're going to pay $100. And um, the client wasn't happy about it and they asked for the invoice uh, to see why exactly hitting a, an engine with a hammer actually costs a uh, uh, hundred dollars? And uh, this is uh, the contents. These are the contents of the invoice: the one dollar for just hitting uh, an engine with the hammer, but the ninety-nine dollars is uh, because the mechanic understands why the engine is broken, understands what the root cause is, and then knows what exactly to do uh, to get rid of this uh, root cause. And now. Um, before I jump into why, which I think is the most fundamental question that you should be asking, uh, let's talk about what, so that you have the whole context of uh, what uh, we usually do uh, when we want to scale the Shiny application. So when you think about sh scaling Shiny, there are two groups of actions that you can make. The first one is called vertical scaling, and this is increasing the amount of users for one machine. And uh, you can do it uh, in two ways. The first one is just adding more resources to your machine. So add more CPU, add more memory. The second uh, uh, way of uh, vertical scaling is making your Shiny application leaner, uh, so allowing more users to use it. Um, and the second group is uh, horizontal scaling, which is just adding more machines. Uh, to put it in this context, uh, first two are actually fairly simple. I know I'm very often asked about how to scale uh, Shiny horizontally, how to have multiple servers with Connect. 
Um, let me tell you this. This is actually very, very simple. Um, I'm going to share with you resources at the end of uh, this presentation so that you can take a look uh, yourself on the contents. Uh, but basically, the first uh, simple step uh, that uh, some people usually do is just ask the DevOps IT uh, if they can increase the size of the server. They add memory, they add CPU. And this right away gives you more users that can use your application. Of course, um, you have to pay for that. And very often, uh, it is difficult to find additional budget for increasing the machine, especially if suddenly you need to, you have 10 times as much users and uh, you need a really, really big machine then. Um, the second step that you can do is uh, talk to DevOps IT and ask for them to ask them to add more servers. Uh, this is um, as simple as just spinning up vir additional virtual machines if you are using cloud, or a little bit more complex if you are if you have like physical machines that you have to turn on and configure. But the good news is that RC Connect is super easy uh, to configure. There are just simple steps that you need to uh, go through, and suddenly all of your machines are going to run RStudio Connect. All of them are going to uh, run your application. And the only thing uh, it costs you is actually uh, real money for the machines. Now, the third thing that you can do is uh, the most difficult one and uh, the one that re requires you to understand why uh, the application may be slow. And this is for you as an R or shiny engineer uh, to find the bottlenecks and uh, to understand uh, what slows the application down and to make the application leaner. Uh, there are three main things that you can do. Of course, there is uh, much more techniques that you can apply, uh, but uh, the key parts are first, to leverage the front end, to use JavaScript. As you saw from the previous presentations, it's not that complex and sometimes you don't even need to understand the JavaScript. If you don't uh, use server to generate HTML and send it back to you when you make changes, it already saves you uh, a very valuable time of uh, your processor. The second one is to extract computations, and this also decreases the CPU usage of your application. If your application is doing something heavily, think about a way to extract those computations somewhere else uh, to leverage uh, ability to use external services and not put all of the pressure on your Shiny application server. And the third one, which is, uh, I think, the most uh, commonly used, is to just use a database. Uh, I have uh, heard a huge amount of uh, success stories when someone just decided to move all of his data or her data uh, into the database, and suddenly the application was uh, easily scalable up to hundreds or thousands of users. Uh, this gives you two advantages, which is less memory usage and less CPU usage. So this is more or less what you need to do uh, to scale your Shiny application. Now, I would like you to fully understand uh, why we actually have to do this. Uh, because when you think about it, RC Connect is a great product that allows you to scale Shiny applications up to tens of thousands of users. Uh, you might have seen uh, Sean Loop's video where, where he shows uh, how this is possible. Um, and also Shiny is uh, very fast on your local machine when you just run it. And why should it be uh, slower for others when there is just uh, more people using it? So. Let me tell you a story based on a very simple application. Um, if you take a look at the code, and this is like a more most uh, simple one uh, that you can write. There is a slider and there is a text output. Uh, server, the only thing that the server does here is uh, the server gets the input slider value whenever it changes and sends the value back uh, as output text. Now, what happens behind the scenes when you uh, send such application to the server? First thing when the user connects to the server is uh, the browser is going to download HTML that is generated by your UI function, CSS, JavaScript, all the static files like images. And uh, at the same time, server is going to create a se separate uh, process for you so that uh, you can uh, start your Shiny session there uh, and you can execute the R code. Now, the thing about processes is that uh, R is single threaded and uh, you can specify how many users you want to have for one process, but you need to realize that if there are two users um, that have the same process assigned and are a single threaded, then when one pro process does something, then the other user cannot actually do anything. I will show you this uh, in a moment, but what you should understand uh, here is that the server creates a process or adds the user to an already existing process, uh, to handle all of the operations on your reactive graph. Now, the second thing that happens is the browser creates a connection through WebSockets, 
and through WebSockets, uh, there are going to be data and uh, information being sent back and forth. Uh, WebSockets are slightly different than the typical REST API that you know, because uh, they allow you to have a bi-directional uh, communication. And that's why the server can actually push some messages to the browser, which is not that uh, uh, possible with uh, uh, symbol, uh, typical applications that have REST API. So the, se the second step is the browser actually binds the Shiny inputs and outputs, and it starts the WebSocket connection with the server. Now, let's say that you are moving the slider and you set the slider to five. The browser is going to send this value to the server. The server is going to uh, check this value, trigger the reactive computation and return uh, the resulting value. So in our example, it is just going to respond to the browser that text is five. Now, uh, coming back to the Pedro's presentation, if instead of just uh, returning a simple value, we returned an updated uh, um, widget, then you would actually have to send the whole HTML if you don't use the update uh, function that uh, Pedro was talking about. If you used update function, then the browser is smart. The browser receives only the data that has changed and in Java, on, Java, on the JavaScript part is going to update the HTML. So this is a huge value already by using the update functions. Now, when it comes to uh, the browser and the server, after the, uh, all of the computations are done, the browser is just waiting for another signals, either from the user or from the server. Now, this is a very simple example. Uh, now, let's take a look what happens when you actually start doing some uh, difficult computations. Instead of uh, just returning the value, I'm going to perform a long, complex CPU operation based on the input slider value. And now the same thing that happens, you send the value uh, through the WebSockets to the server, and within that process that is started for you, the uh, process is just calculating uh, the long running computation that you required uh, him to do. And the problem is that your user no longer is able to uh, make any actions within the application. Everything is gray, it is waiting for the output. And at the same time, new users or old users that uh, have already been using this process also cannot interact with the server and have to wait for this computation to finish. And this is one of the main issues that we see in applications when there is plenty of complex computations happening for one users, the other users are, are blocked or the CPU usage is so high that uh, the uh, other users are seeing that uh, things are going slower for them. So in order to get rid of this problem, you can use uh, multiple solutions. First one, extract some computations to the database. I will show you this in a moment. Second one, you can use Shiny Promises, which is a great package uh, by Joe Cheng that uh, create, uh, allows you to move those computations to a completely new process and uh, makes uh, Shiny free from any computation. You can use Shiny Worker, which is our package for similar computations. Or you can simply move uh, some of the uh, computations to the JavaScript to the front end. Now let's talk about the database. This is the second biggest problem that I see in applications. You might create a successful application that works locally fine, but in fact the uh, application in order to run loads a lot of data into memory. And we need to realize that uh, our computers and uh, are similar to what we have as servers. They, they have their own RAM, they have their own CPU, and RAM usually is around 16, 32 gigabytes. It's not a lot. If in your application you read one gigabyte of data uh, and then you filter this data to do some actions in the application, let's see what happens uh, in the real life. You can see a machine here. Uh, you can see five users that are connected to RCDA Connect. And in this configuration, we create one process for every two users that uh, access our application. This is configurable, this is easy to configure, uh, but uh, for this uh, purpose, uh, let's assume that we have two users per one uh, process. Right now, uh, if you have five users, you already have three gigabytes of data being loaded because every process is like a separate uh, uh, box that uh, contains everything that you need to uh, trigger all of the, to compute uh, everything. And now, when you have, for example, 13 users, suddenly you need to have seven processes and you use seven gigabytes. Let's see, if you have 26 users, it already uses up the 14 gigabytes of data. And when you think about it, 26 users is not a lot. 
So you should be very aware of the fact that uh, the usage of your memory is going to multiply by the amount of users that you have uh, in your application. And you should try to avoid loading too much data into memory. What you can do instead is to set up a separate database and it doesn't have to be a separate uh, SQL server. It could be uh, files on your drive, on the machine's drive that are accessed in a different way than just loading all of that uh, into memory. Uh, you can uh, check out, uh, uh, search online for Christian Igras' uh, uh, talk about different uh, uh, possible ways of reading data. And um, even Uber is uh, having a separate uh, package that uh, basically reads a lot of uh, files, uh, terabytes of data that you can search. This is just files. But when you have an external database, uh, that database contains this one gigabyte, and you just uh, execute a filter a query and you get the result. And here you have two gains. First one is, uh, of course, the fact that you don't have to load the data into memory. But the second one also is the fact that sometimes such filtering is even faster because the database is specially indexed to allow you to make the queries very fast. So just to recap, when you have a successful Shiny application, uh, most likely from the start, because it is a prototype, it is going to look like this. There is a server, there is UI, a lot of communication th through the web sockets and the server is doing a lot of computations uh, by, by themselves. Um, the first thing to do, try to leverage JavaScript, try to move some computations to the browser. The second part, use external server. You can use Plumber API uh, to create a separate server that is going to uh, do the computations for you and then just ping the main server uh, when the computations is, uh, are done. Um, you can use the database, which is the simplest uh, way of uh, already uh, giving you a lot of edge. And then you can just scale horizontally by adding the servers uh, with your IT team. Now, the other way to think about it is you don't want your application to be a slow chess player. You want your application to be the Forrest Gump of uh, table tennis. You want it to just take the ball and give it back right away. When the, when the application, when the, the front end is asking for something, you just respond very quickly. Hey, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this. And the front end knows that something is triggered then uh, you just uh, delegate your job uh, somewhere else. And once the job is done, you, you let front end know that uh, something has changed. Uh, this is similar to um, the, the comparison that I have in my head is that you don't want, for example, your mother to come into your room and tell you, hey, now you have to do uh, your homework and I'm going to stand here and wait until you are finished. Um, you want uh, just to say, hey, do the homework and uh, I will be back uh, or let me know when you're finished. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, way you want to structure your Shiny application. Now, uh, to sum it up, I would like to tell you also how to do this. Uh, there is uh, plenty of resources that, uh, that you can reach. Uh, you will, we will share the slides with you so we can click through those links and uh, see different articles. Uh, there is a separate uh, section for leveraging front end. There is a very nice book about JavaScript for R. And there is um, a section for extracting computations, the Shiny Worker package, Shiny Promises package, uh, Plumber API, uh, great, uh, great resources that you can just uh, jump into and start working with. Uh, for using a database, I recommend using the, uh, reading the main article from our studio that actually goes through every step that you need to, to have the database uh, in your application and to scale vertically and horizontally. Um, there is a very nice uh, page uh, about scaling and perform uh, performance tuning in RStudio Connect uh, that uh, gives you an overview of all of the configuration options, uh, especially how many users you use per the process. And uh, there is a separate doc about high availability, how to scale your application uh, horizontally, how to add additional servers. As I said, this is like really simple. Uh, don't worry about it, just try it. Uh, you can even log into AWS or Google Cloud, set up three virtual machines, install RStudio Connect and see how easy it is to configure. That is all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Hope this is useful and uh, I'm looking forward for the next talk uh, by Mark and Philip. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Damian. That was really interesting. I'm going to go ahead and um, so who is going to be presenting for the last one? Um, is it Philip? Are you going to be sharing your screen or Mark? It's Mark. It's Mark. Mark, oh, got yeah. it. Perfect. So, Mark, let me make you the presenter so that you can go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. And this will be our final discussion before we move into the general Q and A. Uh, 
Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Damian. Uh, super excited. I've learned a lot myself. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is our last talk. Uh, previous talks were uh, mostly focused on uh, what's available to you now. Uh, so they are focused on the present. In this talk, we want to go uh, a little high level, and uh, we want to describe how we envision uh, the future of Shiny and what we do to to fulfill that future. Uh, my name is Philip. I'm the uh, CEO of Absalom, and together with me, uh, we have Marek, our CTO. Hello. Uh, so uh, we want to share what Absalom builds uh, to empower everyone to create uh, spectacular shiny apps. All right, so if you're still with us, uh, I think we can guess that uh, you love shiny just as we do. Uh, I personally believe that Shiny is a, a unique piece of technology. Uh, it empowered thousands of uh, scientists and data scientists worldwide to share, uh, to first to create, and then to share uh, their analysis uh, and useful tools easily. Mm, through the years, we've seen some unique examples, uh, some crazy ones, uh, starting from native iPad, iOS applications, through uh, software as a service, uh, Shiny apps, uh, ending up with offline uh, Shiny applications, on and on and on. Uh, just uh, through pandemic, we created three uh, publicly available dashboards, uh, which were mentioned in the press, and on a given days they uh, received uh, significant traffic. So I think that it is clear by now that Shiny is ready uh, to be used in different environments, enterprise environment, internal uh, environment, external environment. Uh, it is uh, being used uh, by governments, NGOs, and business. But uh, if your app is not basic, if it's not simple, your success is at risk. And there are certain constraints uh, that, you, that every uh, person that works with Shiny needs to be aware of. There are uh, technical and operational uh, challenges waiting for you ahead. Uh, and, and we've seen some great apps uh, fail. Mm. If, if navigated correctly, uh, these challenges can be resolved, risk can be avoided, uh, and, and we think that uh, here we've identified what makes uh, Shiny App successful. So, uh, if you want to make a, a successful app, you need to make sure that people are going to use it and, and to be happy to use it. And uh, Right now, uh, people really don't want to use uh, slow or not great looking uh, Shiny app or any app. People, uh, people's expectations are very high uh, regarding the, the friendliness. I'm not saying your application is ugly. I just say some applications are. Uh, and uh, the, the better it looks, the easier it is to use, the higher the chances of getting buy-in from the people uh, who are going to use it at the end of the day. Uh, and we've seen some teams building uh, apps for many months, struggling to get an, to, to have an impact, and apps being bigger and bigger, slower and slower, uh, and, and apps uh, getting harder to maintain every day. Uh, of course, we also seen teams uh, which managed to uh, create great apps. It is possible, uh, but it's not always uh, straightforward. Uh, and, and also very often, it is not expertise of this certain people to, to work in, in, in such a way. So uh, either uh, 
teams need to be either aware that they might lose uh, speed of development because it's harder to maintain, or they need to gain expertise in other domains, which are not their main domain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our our background uh, is in so, so Absalon was founded by people with background in applied mathematics and and software engineering, and and we uh, kind of we we are attracted to R, we are attracted to Shiny as software engineers, and and we think that this is uh, something we bring to uh, diverse uh, community uh, of of our world uh, and, and we want to embrace uh, our background. We've, bu we've built through the years uh, many different shiny apps. We resolved many different problems, some of them taking months uh, to, to getting resolved. Uh, and, and we think that uh, we can share uh, what we achieved. Mark? Uh, we we believe that uh, our background in, in software engineering and and our tools that we've created uh, can help can be our way to contribute to uh, our community and this way we can uh, empower scientists researchers data scientists worldwide to create uh, spectacular apps themselves. Uh, we believe that this way more apps can be created, uh, they can be created faster, and also uh, together we can uh, mm, encourage more people to try R and Shiny uh, and, 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 and kickstart their, their journey. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one slide that I shared during my talk at uh, user conference in, in Toulouse. Uh, and at that time, I uh, kind of embraced advantages of Shiny uh, when compared to different technologies and, and, and alternatives. Uh, but uh, I, I think the solution to uh, building better Shiny applications also lies in these other technologies. And uh, as much as we have some advantages, we also need to recognize that uh, certain other technologies uh, can teach us uh, how can we do better. Uh, so uh, with, with our mission statement being, uh, being said uh, and uh, which is to empower data scientists to create uh, spectacular shiny apps. I will hand off now to Marek to show you some uh, work that we've actually put into uh, fulfilling on this mission uh, and also to uh, discuss our progress so far. Thank you, Fili. So I'm very excited to share with uh, all of you these new developments that we will be releasing. Uh, and if you have any questions, please pause them in the questions section and we will be happy to answer. Mm, so a great UI is something that takes your Shiny app to an entirely new level. Uh, entirely new level. Uh, and we have heard great talks today from Tom and Shannon on BS Leap and uh, teaming, uh, from Pedro about custom styling, from Dominique who mentioned lots of Shiny extensions. Um, so, so there are a lot of great options already. Uh, however, looking at what is available in other technologies, um, they have not only Bootstrap and Semantic, for example, uh, actually there are tons of libraries for uh, user interfaces and so on. Mm, and not all of them are yet easily available for us in Shai. So, so we are changing a part of that today uh, with two new packages. Um, which are Shiny Fluent and Shiny React. And the main thing I want to talk um, about today is Shiny Fluent. Um, so Shiny Fluent lets you use Microsoft's Fluent UI in Shiny. But what is Fluent UI from Microsoft, first of all? So Fluent is a UI library from Microsoft that is used a lot in their software. Uh, if you use Fluent UI in your app, it can 
basically look like Microsoft's Excel or Outlook uh, and so on. So this means that your app gets a nice professional look, which is a great fit, uh, particularly if your users are in large companies uh, and especially so if your company is already using Office and, for example, Power BI a lot. So we've seen uh, Shiny compete with Power BI quite a lot. Um, and almost always one of the points in favor of Power BI was a better interface. Uh, so today we want to bring this uh, to Shiny. Uh, right, so let, let me open uh, another page. Right, so um, everything you see here is a Shiny application. It's completely uh, coming from Shiny. And uh, this is built uh, using Fluent UI. This is actually a part of our documentation. So you can browse all the components that are available in Shiny Fluent, um, like var various kinds of uh, buttons, for example. Uh, it's it's very configurable. So like you can you can really have a lot of room in defining easily using parameters um, the the appearance and the behavior of, of those buttons. You have uh, you have uh, lots of cool stuff like contextual menu, um, uh, nice nice looking list lists. Uh, I really like uh, some of the features that that Fluent provides for uh, guiding your users through the application, especially uh, for, for the first time, uh, like like the coach mark that can appear and you know contain some explanation. Mm. Uh, of course, there are not nice nice dialog windows and and so on. It's like just all of it looks nice and is so powerful and and configurable. Um, so also Shiny Fluent has uh, all, a lot of components for which uh, often in Shiny we used to have to uh, pull in other packages like custom packages to, to have a nice, uh, some kind of nice input. Uh, so, so a lot of this is already available uh, within Fluent uh, and, and via Shiny Fluent in Shiny. Um, so th there's one problem though here, uh, and it is that uh, Fluent is based on React. Uh, so to get all, all of this appearance, you need to render it via React. Uh, and that's why we built uh, Shiny React, which brings React to Shiny. And the story of Shiny React starts when you thought just about how cool it would be to have a reliable and efficient way of using all the richness of the React ecosystem in our Shiny apps. Just think of it. There are so much um, great stuff there's so much great stuff available in react like all the frameworks material ui blueprint fluent tons of components for charts uh, maps and whatnot uh, and also uh, one uh, thing that is super important is that facebook's team has put a lot of effort into uh, improving its performance uh, so so it, it's it's really fast uh, so it can make also our shiny apps uh, faster Mm, and JavaScript uh, the developers have all of this because they use React, so we should have that too. Um, yeah. So in one sentence, Shiny React aims to let you easily use Shiny libraries in uh, React libraries in Shiny. And I'd like to thank authors of uh, a package that was available earlier, which is React R, uh, for especially for some of the ideas that uh, they have in, in their package, which helped us. And in our scenario and our goal, it, uh, it just didn't work for us um, due to some, some of the limitations. And one example here is that uh, React R seems to be focused more on uh, making uh, and supporting um, individual components uh, or just a few components and not necessarily entire UL libraries. Um, so, What's special about Shiny React? It's, first of all, you can port entire UI libraries. Um, and it's easy for Shiny app developers. Like uh, the inputs that you get are pretty close 
uh, as close as possible to uh, the Shiny API that, that we are used to. Um, I think that was quite quite challenging to achieve is to give the ability to mix and nest Shiny in React and uh, inside that have Shiny again, uh, like outputs from Shiny and, and so on, uh, so that we can still use all the Shiny components that we are used to. Uh, it also provides documentation for the components uh, coming from, from the original packages, but inside the R documentation uh, system, which is very useful. And basically it solves a lot of practical challenges that uh, you just don't have to think about. Uh, so, so this is what made uh, Shiny Fluent possible. And I'm excited to see what other libraries can be, can be made available this way. Uh, but let's go back to Shiny Fluent. So this is a most basic app. And what's special here is it just, you just use the library. So you load the package, Shiny Fluent, and then um, you just have to wrap your code in, in a with React function call. And inside you can use all the components that are uh, taken from, from Fluent. Uh, you can use all, all of their properties and, and so on. Uh, so, so basically this code gives you these two nice buttons. Uh, but so that, so that you fully believe me, uh, I'd like to do a quick live demo. Uh, so this is an application that we built just in a couple of hours uh, using, uh, using Fluent UI. It's again, all shiny. Um, so a scenario that we picked is that, let's say we want to analyze uh, how our sales department performs and uh, which sales reps, uh, rep sales representatives perform best. So you can see here those, all those nice inputs uh, that I, I think uh, are very, very just pleasant to use. Um, it's always an issue with late pickers. Um, so, so I, I really like how they solved this in Fluent. Um, really nice components like, like this people picker, uh, which can show you a lot of details about, uh, about the, uh, uh, the people that, that, that you pick. Um, a really nice uh, list view, uh, but what's also interesting is that it, what you can see here, this is a regular leaflet map, like inserted with a leaflet output, uh, but this leaflet output is inside uh, an entire structure which was put here, uh, not like like we used to do, but by, by React. Uh, so it's not obvious that this works, <laughs> believe me. Uh, so, so this is really cool that you can, this shows that you can embed, uh, what we already have in Shiny inside React. And then, then the same here with, with this plotly, uh, plot. Um, so let's, so, so this is a truly live demo. Let's try to make a, a change to this app, add some functionality. Uh, let's see how, if, if we succeed. And so let's say we want to, uh, filter, uh, this list of deals closed closed by by the sales reps. Uh, we want to filter out the smallest deals, like have some li minimum limit for uh, uh, for the amount of the deal. Uh, so we can use uh, well, let's let's uh, find some component that we want to use. Uh, so we can pick slider, for example, and we can see that slider is just we just need to insert the slider uh, and give it an input ID as, as user, usually in Shiny. Um, so let's let's do that. Let's go to our studio. Uh, so we can go to to where where the filters are. Uh, this is our UI code. Right. <laughs> so we have we have the slider. Uh, there's lots of configuration options, so uh, and you can just type, uh, you know, type uh, question mark slider, and then 
you, you will get that in the uh, in the documentation window, uh, all, the, all the options available. Uh, but let's say we, we define a step of uh, 100,000 and uh, we give a label. Uh, we can configure how to format that. Uh, right, so this gives us already an input that we can use in our server uh, part. So now what we need to do is just to filter the items uh, uh filter the items based on the input value and that's that should do it let's refresh the app right and we have the we have the slider here uh so i think it, it looks really nice it's it's just a really beautiful slider uh, if a slide can be beautiful, um, I I just really like how how it uh, smoothly moves. Uh, anyway, it's it's very consistent with the entire look. Um, um, right, we could we could add some debounce here. Um, anyway, as you can see, we can filter uh, out the deals just to the to the biggest ones. Um, so. Uh, coming back to the presentation. So the good news is that all of this will be open source, uh, and we will be releasing this in the just in the coming weeks, uh, starting with an early access group. So uh, if you're interested, please fill out the uh, masterclass feedback form. Uh, the link will be at the end of this presentation, uh, and make sure to there's a checkbox uh, which you can check to. Uh, be in the early access uh, group for shiny fluid so uh, make sure to do that if you're interested in that and you can already today uh, open the app with the demo uh, at this url uh, all right and uh, so the second area that i want to cover uh, is developer tools so you may have seen august great talk about best practices uh, just a while before uh, and what what she did was a uh, she shared a lot of best practices that that we uh, use in the community uh, and she did this in a non opinionated way so that no matter what technology there were there were some examples but no matter what technology choices you make uh, you can still use these best practices there are a lot of options um, at the same time uh, at Absalon we are building patterns and uh, development workflow tools uh, that realize these best practices uh, in a very opinionated way, which is, in our opinion, uh, just just works best uh, in, in most projects. So today I'd like to share with you that we will be publishing a kind of first of its kind uh, Shiny application framework. So I think that on, runs on, on top of Shiny and lets you be more efficient. Uh, for uh, building production apps. So there are a lot of areas that you can take uh, care of uh, to make your app work well in production. You don't necessarily have to take care of all of them, uh, but but if you do, uh, it really, really increases your chances of success. Um, so over the years, we've built uh, tools for all of these areas and uh, in the coming months, we will be gradually sharing them as a unified framework. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, basically, all of the points from the previous slide matter because ultimately, for apps that work in production, uh, the users, your users depend on them. And we need to ensure that they're, first of all, reliable and easy to maintain. Uh, but also for our projects to be successful, we need to do that, uh, ach achieve maintainability and reliability while keeping the development velocity uh, high, uh, which like keep the velocity that Shiny is famous for. Uh, so just some examples of what you will get with the framework out of the box. Uh, mature uh, domain-driven application structure, end-to-end -end tests, uh, like on this example of Cypress, uh, comprehensive but easy to use 
dependencies management, like Olga mentioned, um, data validation. Uh, so what's really new here compared to existing solutions? Uh, I, I think there are three main things. First of all, it's a complete uh, framework, a complete ecosystem covering, uh, like giving you an option for all of all of the points uh, that you need to think of. Mm, then it's uh, just the fact that we bring best practices from other technologies uh, in areas where, where as a shiny community, we can uh, benefit most uh, by learning from other technologies. And uh, the third, uh, you get all these best practices, not as, 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 a, as knowledge, but as code. So you can start your project from scratch with all the best practices included, and um, you can learn what you, which parts you need. Like you can learn each part that you need uh, from the code that is already in your project and it's already working, uh, and you can learn from that. Uh, right. So uh, back to Philippe. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so our workflow. Uh, uh, and Shiny Fluent and, and Shiny React are going to be fully open source. Uh, we are excited to share our frameworks and our way of work, uh, but we think that sometimes frameworks are just not, not enough. They, they, they don't cut it on, on, on their own. Uh, and, and this is why we want to create another resource for uh, our community. Uh, so, so in other communities, uh, if you want to create your WordPress page, if you want to create your e-commerce store, if you want to create your static bootstrap website, uh, you can browse, I bet, thousands, if maybe hundreds, uh, depending on the use case, uh, pre-made quality uh, templates and layouts. You can choose, pick, your, uh, pick the one you like. You can download or buy and customize with, with a fraction of work. Uh, necessary to build everything from scratch, uh, and th and this is why we uh, 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 we decided to uh, do the same thing for uh, our shiny community. Uh, so, uh, Mark, uh, so, so we we decided to share some of uh, our work. Uh, our shiny apps are. Uh, often uh, complemented for uh, how they look. And we are uh, quite proud uh, about taking care of uh, great design. We deeply care here uh, about stuff being both uh, easy to use and beautiful and useful. Uh, so uh, some of the layouts that were crafted by our engineers and designers are going to be available some of them for free some of them uh, to buy uh, on the on the platform that we are going to share with uh, with everyone so uh, what did we promise today first uh, shiny fluent and, and shiny react are going to be uh, open source uh, you can create great uh, enterprise grade applications uh, uh, for especially for enterprise ecosystem with Shiny Fluent. And uh, we should expect more uh, React uh, uh, libraries being ported as R packages uh, available to us. Uh, second, uh, we will open source a lot of our internal tools uh, to empower the whole community uh, to leverage what we've discovered in many of our projects uh, so that the whole community can uh, move forward much faster. At least we hope so. Third, uh, we will help kickstart uh, hopefully more teams and more uh, Shiny developers their own work with pre-made uh, templates and layouts. Uh, all this we do because we want to empower data scientists and scientists and researchers worldwide uh, to create uh, more and better uh, shiny apps so that together we can have more impact and help other people make uh, wiser decisions for the data. 
how you can help us is uh, through using uh, using our work and giving us feedback. Uh, hopefully, uh, also contributing uh, either by uh, the source code or even by uh, in other ways that Dominic mentioned, uh, helping with uh, documentation or back reports or feature requests. Uh, all of this is uh, well welcomed. And now specifically, the next step that you can take to help us is uh, to give us feedback uh, directly after this session uh, about how we did and what do you think about our work. Uh, if you value what we do, and uh, then, then, then please, uh, please give us feedback. Uh, in this form, you can also uh, quickly uh, check all the check marks to subscribe to newsletter and get uh, info about what we've learned uh, regarding Shiny. You can also get early access to Shiny Fluent. And uh, if you sign up uh, this way uh, to uh, to our uh, template platform uh, during the uh, conference, you will also get one premium type template for for free. Uh, and I think that that's it. Uh, I want to take this opportunity and and thanks and and thank Sam and our studio for having us here today for organizing this wonderful event uh, for for all of us. We are uh, very happy and excited to be part of this event and the whole community. Uh, and I wish all of us a great conference tomorrow. Uh, and please feel free to reach out to any of us here and any from our team, we are uh, very happy to, to get to know you and answer your question. That was wonderful. Thank you, Philip and Merrick. I'm, I'm excited. I want to go get one of those templates for myself, if I'm allowed. <laughs> um, so I might go check that out as well. Um, I also posted the link to fill out that form in the chat everyone um so that you can easily just click on that in there as well um so it looks like we're a little over we have i'm gonna hand it over to uh olga for just to help us wrap it up and then it looks like we'll have time for maybe two or three questions i know there's a ton that came in through the chat here um what i'm going to do is save all of those and we will somehow whether it's a blog post in our community thread we'll help get some answers to those questions and share them with everyone but in the meantime, let me quickly lob it over to Olga to do a quick closing, and then I will quickly jump into two or three questions for the team to answer. So Olga, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, can we do it uh, one more time? Because I messed something up and I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Yeah, totally. No problem. I was going to say, whatever you are sharing looks good, but let's try this again. Let me. Uh, but, uh, can you see the presentation? Or um... yes. Mastering okay. with Absalon okay. from development, right. development. Is that the right I, one? I wasn't... Yeah, it is the right one, but I wasn't uh, sure uh, what is being displayed, and I thought it's maybe a screen with all the, um, all the faces. Oh. <laughs> no, this um... looks great. We can see it. Yeah, so I, I want to thank everyone for sticking with us until the end. And um, I know uh, it's been a long session, so I will be very quick. So I want to highlight that uh, we are hiring and these are just a um, few roles that we are currently looking for. Um, we are fully remote uh, team right now. And we intend to stay so. We currently have teammates in Europe, uh, South America, and uh, Africa. And um, we are looking for kind, willing to learn uh, people who care about uh, the, the technology and the impact their work is doing, who also want to work with a team that believes technology can be used uh, for good. And um, we strive for uh, excellence, innovation, which I think we, um, Philip and Marek proved uh, in their uh, previous talk. We are um, responsible, uh, kind, 
uh, trust and eager to help uh, each other team and uh, why you should believe me so i am uh, one of the first people who joined epsilon i am working uh, at epsilon for over uh, five years so um I, I can truly say that we um i think we have a unique uh, culture and we challenge ourselves uh, to do better we uh, strive uh, to build an inclusive and uh, diverse uh, company. Um, if you are into shiny, um, I think we are, this is not going to be very modest, but we are definitely one of the top companies uh, to work with. We have tons of uh, exciting uh, projects in our uh, pipeline. Um, and let me give uh, a bit of my uh, personal perspective as well. So Absilon offers um a growth opportunities uh you can do a lot of uh, challenging work you can uh, develop both uh, as an individual contributor but also as a manager at the same time uh, you can uh, have a challenging ca career but also um a healthy work-life balance so uh, you can uh, have a family uh, you can take uh, long uh, holidays, uh, personal uh, personal time off, um, and uh, I want to share a story that happened to me uh, before Christmas. So we had a super intensive end of year. Uh, a lot of us were working under uh, a lot of pressure, and um, I had a challenge while uh, building a shiny app for one of our clients and I needed help and I posted a question uh, on our uh, Slack uh, texting channel and asked for help and within minutes I got a um, few uh, high quality uh, responses from the team members that were at least as busy as I were willing to help me that actually unlocked me and I could move forward and this is this is very unique uh, about uh, Absilon that we are really eager uh, to help each other um, and, and we care about uh, the quality of uh, work uh, that we are producing. So uh, please, uh, if you are not um, sure uh, if you want to apply and have some questions, feel free to reach out to me or other people uh either via email or on twitter uh we are uh, happy to talk to you thank you very much and uh, moving to the next slide um also if you are looking uh for a team of shiny experts or data scientists uh, we are uh, happy to help we work with uh enterprises small business businesses universities and uh, ngos and now over to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Olga. And just as someone on the outside uh, working at, at our studio, um, the Apps One team has been great to work with. Um, they're a fantastic partner. They do a lot of great stuff with our customers and with open source content. Um, so it looks like we have enough time for three questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and we're just gonna go through. And if anybody on the panel has an answer, go ahead and jump into it. If not, either Olga or myself will pick on you and you can try to answer it. So um, the first question, I think this might be for Philip. Um, if folks were to start playing around with Shiny Fluent, is there a developer mode available? Is there anything on GitHub if people want to start poking around? Or are we still excitedly waiting with bated breath? So uh, it is already on GitHub, but access is limited. So this is why we ask you to let us know uh, by completing the form. And once you do, uh, we are going to uh, grant access in batches uh, so that we learn about uh, initial hiccups, resolve them, and uh, involve more and more people. Uh, and in a couple of weeks, uh, hopefully, uh, this is going to be uh, fully available to, to everyone. Uh, but we need uh, people uh, who want to get early access. That's the only way uh, for us to prove this in the field. So uh, please don't postpone reaching out if you want to try. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so now I've got one more here, and I think anyone could really answer this. Um, I'm thinking maybe either Tom, Olga, or Damien. 
But when it comes to working with Shiny apps, what is the advantage of using the RM package? Um, what are some pros? What are some cons? Why would you choose to use that? I can say that uh, the advantage is uh, huge, basically. Like, uh, we've been working with many different projects and trying to maintain the same environment uh, across different applications. And it's always a big challenge. You can use Docker and you can have your uh, packages uh, just baked into the image and it's going to work well for you. But if you have multiple, multiple projects and you want to uh, run different uh, projects uh, across the same environment, uh, then you would have to create separate Docker for each of them. Uh, RM itself solves a huge amount of uh, problems uh, you can have uh, when you don't have the same uh, version of the package. Uh, but uh, I guess the question is about uh, why RM not uh, Packrat. I know that uh, we are uh, all of uh, us at uh, our co our community are moving towards RM uh, from Packrat. Packrat uh, used to have a few very small issues that would make it uh, quite difficult. Uh, at some point to work with. Uh, RNF solves, uh, solves a huge amount of, uh, of problems and uh, is like uh, currently the cleanest way to maintain your environment. And I encourage all of you to take part in uh, working with RNF and uh, switching to it. Uh, of course, the advantages of using RNF and not using anything to maintain your environment are, uh, are enormous, basically. Uh, if you don't have RNF and you send someone uh, your uh, application to run, to develop locally, uh, that person is going to run the application with all of the libraries that they have installed on their computer. They can have different versions, they can uh, miss uh, one of the packages, for example, and uh, it can turn out that the application works different on their machine than it works on yours. It gets worse where you when you deploy to production, for example, and then you realize that, for example, one of the packages has a different version and is going to calculate something differently. Maintaining the same versions of packages is very important uh, when it comes to the reproducibility and uh, having high quality. And Damian, is there a situation where you would not use RN? Like a situation where, where it would be better not to use it? Maybe that's an interesting follow up question. I don't think there is, uh, to be honest, because uh, it's so simple to use that uh, it just doesn't make sense not to use it, I would say. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that it has a very simple API. It's uh, really easy to set up, really easy to use, uh, and especially to collaborate uh, between the team members. So following up on Marek's question, uh, I think that you could not use RNF if you have all of the uh, packages baked into a Docker image that you want to, to use and uh, reuse everywhere because then all of the requirements are already there but even if i create a docker image i would create it by installing rnf uh, itself because it's just uh, lists all of the requirements that i need for this ap application so it just doesn't make sense to me not to use it got it thank you and so i think we have enough time for one more question um and I think this could really go to anyone, really. Um, maybe, maybe Pedro, maybe be Tom. But so, how does Bootstrap Lib BS Lib package interact with a Shiny app that already has CSS style sheets present in that? Um, do they do they interact well? Is that messy? What does that necessarily look like? I'll speak to it at a high level and then happy to turn it over to one of the Absalon folks. Um, so if you think of Bootstrap, that's a, um, you often hear people say the word like clobber in terms of other CSS. Like you do have to be careful with a large style sheet, uh, kind of taking some of the manual work you've done and overriding it. So if you think of um, some examples of people taking HTML widgets and theming portions of it, then throwing it into Bootstrap and Bootstrap taking over the theming at that point. Um, so I would say start with a framework, whether it's um, Semantic or BSLib or Fresh or one of those other kind of meta languages, and then make sure that when you are playing around with uh, individual CSS components or SAS components that they play nicely locally first. Yeah, uh, and just to uh, add a bit here, it really depends like what kind of changes you actually did. 
and it really depends how much you forced your changes uh, when it comes to the styling. So uh, if you did it correctly and you're just lightly changing uh, some of the style, uh, most likely it will actually work quite well. So this would be, for example, if you're simply changing the border radius or uh, making like a small accents throughout the application. Um, because the way, uh, be, because what's actually happening is that there's a version of Bootstrap being styled, uh, being created specifically with the styles you defined in the package. Um, it's technically uh, targeting the same elements with the same rules. It's just applying different styles. Uh, so the, the the base bootstrap or the style bootstrap would actually have the same the same rules, just different values. So your styles would probably work fine uh, unless you really went crazy on on changing some of the things. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. So I think we are at the top of our time limit for today, but for one, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I've learned so much about things that I thought I knew. So this is really great for me. I'm gonna go play around and with all of these new toys. Um, I wanna thank everyone uh, from Absalon and our studio for joining us today. Uh, everyone put in a lot of hard work and I think this has been a great workshop. Um, again, uh, for those listening, all of the recording and the material will be made available via email and online following our studio global. And I hope everyone can join us tomorrow for our 24 hour marathon. And with that, I will let everyone go. And thank you all so much for joining us today.